Well, good morning. Welcome to Wabash Valley Woodworkers Club webinar on the use of the biscuit joinery system. I'd like to introduce the four members of our crew in uh, alphabetical order. Uh, behind me is Dan Bullock. Uh, Bill Calder is taking a leave of absence, should be back here in a couple minutes. Nelson Howell, who is behind our camera, and he is our AV uh, tech guru here, and I'm Bill Reese. Now I'm going to have uh, Dan uh, introduce our lead speaker. Yeah, well, um, we're here at the Wood Research Lab. And we do a lot of testing of furniture here. We teach students about um, wood and wood properties. And uh, it was nice that Ava Havarovia has showed up today to uh, talk a little bit about strength of design of furniture. Uh, she has her doctorate in wood science. And uh, she's written and, and done uh, lots of articles on strength of joinery and furniture, um, amongst other stuff and uh, tested hundreds of hundreds of joints and, and pieces of uh, furniture. So she's going to talk a little bit about the science and engineering behind um, joineries. So I would like to welcome you in the Wood Research Laboratory. Uh, this is a place where we are doing uh, different types of joinery, uh, different types of uh, strength design of furniture, uh, different types of wood science, and then also we produce a lot of interesting furniture with uh, students. This lab is in operation for many, many years. So while we are, we actually celebrated something about uh, 108 years uh, of uh, existence. And then I just uh, wanted to kind of insert a little bit of that kind of uh, knowledge uh, in your uh, workshop. So uh, uh, before we will start to talk about uh, join, I would like to say that they are essential part of uh, behavior of the structures. Uh, if we are talking about structures, many of you are working on furniture, I believe, yes? So I will be always referring to chair because I think chair, it's kind of like a, a king uh, and a queen of the furniture. And then I have a little model, which is side frame of the chair. And I have also a, a kind of like a little sketch of that chair. So if you can imagine, this is how it is. So my chair is ha having a back leg, front leg, and some stretchers. And this in reality, when you are thinking about chair, people are sitting and standing on a chair and, and leaning backwards and so on, so they are applying some load. So furniture will have some kind of load being applied, like let's say my hand will be sort of mimicking uh, somebody sitting. And then what will really happen if you would like to assess the structural behavior of the uh, furniture piece, chair and so on, we have to understand that it is very well linked with uh, structural behavior of joints. So this load is going to be transferred into the joints and then that joint joinery will kind of uh, float that load through the chair into the ground and that will be some kind of reaction forces posing back on that chair. And simple way to explain it, we will have this sketch here. Yes, I will just kind of turn it a little bit around. So we are having that apply load going on the chair and then they are going to be eventually flowing through the joints, through the members going to the reaction forces. So I will decide, I decided to take one member, which is this one, A and B, same thing as this stretcher here, and I just put it on the right side. And I would like to tell you that within that member, there are three kinds of forces, most important one, axial forces, which, which are sort of pulling this member aside. I have another one to show you. So if you are sitting on this chair, putting the load, and when we are kind of pulling on that, so they are withdrawal, which are axial forces, withdrawal, and they are compression forces here. So one stretcher is in tension, another one is in compression. So those would be axial forces. Then we are having shear forces at the same member. They are kind of trying to spin that member around in a way, yes? So one is going upwards, the other one downwards. And then last set of the forces, it would be bending forces. These forces are probably most important ones because they are just 
largest one, I would say. So I will just kind of mark them in red. And another thing what I have to mention is that all three forces are pausing on the same time. So for simplicity, we just decided to take the most important one or maybe most detrimental forces, which would be bending forces. And we decided to concentrate on this one simple joint, which is here, okay? So in this session, we are going to kind of compare or benchmark different types of joinery. I have a chair here, but maybe your joinery is more suited for drawers or maybe for cabinetry or other type of things. So, but basically, we are going to just test one thing, and it will be testing the joints and comparing different types of joints. So let's go to the uh, second step, and it would be what type of joints we are having here. I have a few examples. This is classic, mortise and tendon joint. Probably king and queen of the old, old joint A. It is very good joint A, but also it is kind of challenging because you have to make sure that you are um, doing all this setup of the machine so it will be a very precise joint. It works only well when you are having good tolerances. If this joint doesn't have a good tolerances, it may not be a, a good one. There are several variables in these joints. You can kind of improve the strength of the joint and it will be changing the length changing the, the uh, thickness and width of the do joint, changing the tolerances, changing the aprons, or, or kind of like a shoulder fit. So that is also influencing the strength and changing the adhesive. So all of these variables would influence the strength of the joint. I have to also say one more thing. We are having joints and fasteners. So if, if this joint is part of the member, it calls joints. When we are having another one, that it is not part of the member, such as dowel. So even dowel is called fastener. If you are having steel components, like barrel nuts or any others, those are also fasteners. So for simplicity, we are going to refer to all of our, our stainless joints, but even biscuit joint is not necessarily a joint. It's supposed to be a fastener, okay? So here we are having a classic one, dowel. Single dowel is not the best of all things, but you know, it, it can be like that. We have also two dowels here. This is very good joint because you can kind of change few things. Same as with a uh, uh, mortise and tenon joint, you can change diameter of the dowel, you can change spacing of the dowel, you can change length of the dowel, you can change tolerances, you can change adhesives, you can change also uh, grooving of the uh, dowels. So uh, a lot of things you can improve the joint uh, strength. Few examples, dovetails, little challenge to do, but you know, excellent joint for drawers. It's also a bit, one more, a bit complicated, complex one. This would be more of the Japanese type of joinery, I would say. Very nice joints here. Then I have gusset plates, so those would be fasteners. This would be appropriate for upholstery uh, type of things or maybe something that you don't see, some kind of like a sofas and, and others. Uh, it can be just a simple plywood. Actually, gusset uh, joinery was developed in this lab. Uh, we have few uh, research done in that. This is my favorite joint. And so this is kind of like a, a little mimicking uh, mortise and tenon joint, almost like a crossbreed between dowel, dowel, uh, dowel joint and then also mortise and tenon joint. This one would be handmade, raved, uh, green type of joinery made by John Alexander. Uh, for green woodworking chairs. And this is kind of like a copy of it, uh, which is in a bigger format, something like this. So you will have a tenon, round tenon, and then you are having some mortises. So you have a beautiful corner joint right here. This could be suitable for a modular barn or some other types of structures. On this one, I have a lap joint. This is extremely strong type of joint, so you are just only cr cross-lapping uh, thinner members. It can have uh, several layers. This one is having uh, oh, s five layers, but it can be more than that. Then we are having mitre joints. Oh, mitre joints, they always give us trouble. You know, to do a good mitre joint, that's, that's a challenge. Uh, but there are uh, machines out there that you can just make it uh, really special. Uh, here you are, I have these little butterfly joints here, these little inserts. They work very well for frame construction. I have even a Velcro joint here. 
This was probably one of the creation of, of students, but this was meant to be for uh, beta rails, uh, and it's actually very active, uh, very, very strong joint. Uh, it's kind of difficult to disassemble, but it works. Uh, there, there are some fasteners, some mechanical joints. These ones are older. I don't even know if I will be able to pull them out. You know, just some screws and a few pieces there. Of course, screw joints under different angles, you know, like pockets. Staple joints, you know, they, they even make them as a, a T-shaped joints with staples. Uh, of course, screw joints, more of those, just a simple one. If, if you don't really see it, if you can hide it, nothing wrong with it. And I didn't mention one thing. When we are doing any type of joinery, it means you need to obtain some kind of angle. So we have a full beam, yes? And the strength of this beam, let's say that it's 100%. And if you will cut it in half and you would like to make an L-shaped joint, we immediately are going to decrease that strength. And then it says that it's somewhere around half, so maybe 50%. And so if you would like to improve it with the joinery, we have several options what we can do. And that strength can go all the way down to 10% if we are not smart about it and if we are not doing good, good kind of choices. So one of the good idea is to avoid the joint. And then uh, there was a lot of work done with bending. So we did a lot of bending. It's challenging, but it is possible. So if you will be able to bend 90 degrees or even more, then is having few experiences with, with that, you are able to maintain that 100% strength level, which is really amazing. This is another thing to make angles, you know? So you can make an angle. Or you can make kind of shaping. Uh, it's not 100% strength, but you know, you can do that. I have a variety of books. Uh, I'm sure each of you are having some. This one I like to teach with. This is what I like to motivate students if they would like to be a Japanese woodworkers. And then I think uh, this uh, book is my favorite because it's just referencing a lot of things and it's very simple, uh, straightforward. Uh, maybe a little bit more to mention. Our furniture making, especially here at the, in the lab, is getting more into an area of CNC manufacturing. Uh, so our students are not having that much time to develop special skills as, uh, as, as people in your club. So very often they are very gifted in terms of uh, uh, graphical designs. And then they have to come up with some kind of interesting way how to solve joinery. And so CNC joinery, uh, computer num numerically controlled joinery, is a little bit different. It is quite a uh, change when we are going from stick structure to plate type of structures. And so they are coming with different types of joints. If you can see a little bit closer, so there are all sorts of variations, a little bit like a Mickey Mouse ears, uh, or maybe circles, or this lock type of joints, which they, they could can kind of be a little bit more complex. Something like that with a little hook. So all sorts of little innovations which we are working on and trying to kind of see what would work this is even something else, so, okay. Okay, and uh, I guess to close up this little session of the joinery, I have to say that there is a big difference when we are selecting joineries for what kind of purpose we are doing so. Uh, many members of your club are doing a special projects which are called one of a kind type of project. So you are basically making artwork. You are making this artistic kind of one piece of furniture and you have a luxury to choose more complex type of joinery and joinery where you are also implementing a little bit of artisan type of uh, quality. Uh, when we are thinking about uh, production on an industrial type of level, we do not have that luxury. So we, are ha we have to be kind of careful what type of joinery we are selecting for that type of production. So it needs to be something that we can build in quality control and it can be relatively simple. And with that, if you have any questions, I will be more than happy uh, to answer later on. And uh, you can please make sure that you will be in touch with our lab and uh, we, you are more than welcome to visit us anytime. Thank you for your attention. So today we have eight different types of joints that we're going to test. And um, we want to see how strong they are. So in Ava's talk, she talked about the chair and how you could look at it as a member here and a member here and a load here. Um, so we're gonna do that. And 
you know, this, the joint for this corner here could be used um, possibly in a chair, but more, more than likely it's going to be on a drawer or a case or something. Um, there's lots of different ways you could pull this thing apart. Um, you know, if you think of a drawer, you're pulling that drawer in and out, and so maybe it would make more sense if it, you were testing drawers to try to pull this apart um, instead of loading it here. But loading it here is a pretty easy thing for us to do. Um, so we've got this machine here. It uh, is an old machine, uh, probably like circa 1950 or something, but it still works. It's got uh, vacuum tubes in it, believe it or not. So at some point, I you know, one of those tubes will probably break and we'll have a hard time replacing it. Um, but it can generate about 30,000 pounds of force. It's screw driven. It's got this really cool backlit dial, which I think is pretty kind of, I don't know, retro cool. Um, so we've set up this steel um, angle iron here. It's mounted to the bed. We're going to mount our angle in here. And then this uh, wooden block here is, is glued to the top and it's going to come down and load. And we're going to do it until you'll see this dial on this thing start to move and that shows you how many pounds it's taking of force. And eventually that will kind of stop or start going back. And when it does that, we know that the joint has failed, so we'll stop the thing. Um, we are going to run this about a quarter of an inch per minute in, as far as speed. So, you know, it might take a few minutes to actually break one of these parts. Um, but what we want to do for you guys is show relatively which joint are strong, which ones are weak. Now, when we do this for um, students, it's always kind of fun to say, okay, you know, how much load is this thing going to take to break? And um, of course, younger kids are like five pounds or something crazy. Um, but it's, it's something interesting to kind of think about. Um, and we've got a 10, 10 inch moment arm here. So we have, you know, a bending moment. We have some shear going on too. Um, so yeah, there's a couple different thing, kind of forces going on here. So we're going to mount this and then we'll, we'll break it. So I don't know if you can see this dial is already starting to go a little bit. So anytime you lean on this bed or put something on the bed, that's how it registers the forces. So now that Bill's gotten off of it, it's gone back to zero. We've got it actually dialed down a little bit so it only goes up to 300 pounds. We could change it so it would go up to 30,000, but that's uh, too small of a amount. You know, we want to be able to read more accurately so we have it dialed down. So load, we're going to go down. So I'll push load and we've got it on test here. We're going to move it up to about quarter inch, but first I want to kind of go a little faster so it gets down on the part because we've got about an inch to go here before it hits it. So it's moving, but I'll slow it down here once it gets close. So I don't know if you can see that on the video, but it's gotten real close. And now I'll just kind of wait here. You know, this thing's kind of jiggling a little bit. Um, so it's just barely starting to kiss it now. We have this follower dial here too, so I'll move this back. And this dial here will move with the other dial. And then when this dial goes back, this one will stay where it was so we can read the force. So it's up to 15, it's up to 30. Um, yeah, I, I will, I forgot about that, Bill. Uh, 45, up to 60 pounds. Bill uh, Reese made this joint, so he, I think, did a really good job of, of cutting it and gluing it together. So it's holding, holding pretty good. You know, that's it really a lot. If you think about it, you know, a person could sit on that right now and it, it would hold them. So it got up to two, backing off now. So I'm just going to stop it. It got up to about 250 pounds. So that's really pretty amazing. I'm going to back it off a little bit now, so I'll unload it. So yeah, this was, um, we, we used white oak and red oak for all of our specimens, first of all. And we used uh, Titebond 3 to glue them together. 
which is a pretty strong glue. Um, so this particular joint that we just tested is just a simple miter joint. Uh, there's no, no joinery really um, mechanical or integral in this. It's just simply mitered, glued together, which, um, you know, it's sort of, I, we know that this end grain does not glue very well and long grain does. And this has, you know, sort of a combination of long and end grain. Um, and it just shows that if you make this well, glue it well, clamp it well, it's going to hold together fairly well. But we want to do, you know, relative testing. So we want to see how this compares to other ones. So we're going to write down um, and record what that was. So this one is a miter with biscuits. So we'll see if biscuits improve the miter at all. And um, this was, looks like it's mainly red oak here. And, you know, it's 12 inches by 12 inches, just to let you know. So we'll go ahead and clamp this one on. So we got this one uh, clamped up, and now we'll go ahead and run it. And do you think this one's going to be stronger? So it's a miter, similar to the last one we did, but we added biscuits to it. We'll see if those biscuits add anything to the strength. They certainly can help to make it easier to glue the joint together. And I think Bill Reese did this one too, so we'll see how well Bill did. It's good to kind of critique our, our assemblers, Bill Calder and Bill Reese, so we'll see who's the better woodworker. Kind of slowing down. A, a common thing that we like to do when we test things also is to figure out the strain as, as it's being tested. And the strain is, in effect, the deflection versus the, the length of the moment arm. Um, and so, so a lot of times we'll plot the forces versus the strain. And you can see a, uh, on those charts, um, it gives you a lot of information about the strength of the material. And a lot of times it'll be kind of a, a straight line and then it'll kind of loop over at the top where it fails. And the, the straight line, the slope of it, is called the uh, modulus of elasticity. Um, Hooke's Law, he's the famous scientist who came up with that or discovered it. And that's also the elastic region uh, where if you're in that region, you can back off the force, and then the thing will, the, the piece will kind of um, straighten back up. Once that line starts curving, it becomes plastic deformation, where once you, once you, uh, well, that kind of was a loud little ping. So, like I was gonna say, uh, the plastic deformation, once you back off on the load, it will permanently be deformed. So this one got up to about 150 pounds. And um, you know, and this is just, this is, we're just doing one, one test on each joint. Um, so we can't say definitively that the biscuits make it weaker. Um, we really should test a minimum five pieces really to be able to say anything. But it was a hundred pounds weaker than the um, one without the biscuits. So I'm going to take this out. We'll take a look at it. So you can see um, there's a little separation right here in the crack. Um, so either you know maybe Bill didn't do as good a job on gluing this one together, possibly. So we we could blame it on Bill. Um, we could blame it on the biscuits. So it's whichever one you want to blame, I guess. Something when we are doing uh, our joints and then when we are taking material out of the wood, like for example, when we are just doing those holes uh, for the biscuit, we are actually weakening that wood. And so we are changing that nature of the uh, irregular joints to the mechanical mm -hmm. joints. So it can help us in that respect of mechanical joints, but maybe it is still weakening the wood. Mm -hmm. so yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yep. We'll, we'll grab another one. Which one do you want to do, Bill? Let's do the uh, locking miter. Okay, so this is another form of a miter joint. Um, it's called a lock miter. So you have to get a special router bit to, to make this. It does help a lot on the um, assembly because this, I don't know if you want to 
zoom in on this, Nelson. So it's got this little indention here where the parts lock together. So when you're assembling it, the miters don't slide back and forth on you. It makes it a lot easier. Now maybe you wouldn't want this to show on a nice case piece, um, but you know I don't think it's ugly or anything. Um, if, if you're gonna, uh, maybe on a case piece, you could put a piece over that or something if you don't like the looks of it, but it doesn't bother me that much. So here again, we'll load this up. There again, it'll take a couple minutes for it to do it. Well, it's already moving. So uh, we're at 15. You know, do you think this lock miter will be stronger than a regular miter? We'll see. Um, it's up to 45 pounds. You know, one thing that's kind of cool on this machine here, there's an awesome saying that one test is worth a thousand expert opinions. So I think all of us think that we're experts or, you know, you've made a lot of furniture. Hey, I know what I'm talking about. Um, but really, you need to test it to see, see what's true and what's not. Uh, it's up to 105 pounds. Okay, I'm going to stop it. That one got up to 270 and then started backing off, so we'll call it 270 pounds. So that one really did pretty good. I wasn't sure how that lock might or if that would uh, make it any weaker or not since you're kind of putting that notch in the part, but did really well. Uh, so far the lock miter is winning the battle. Uh, yeah, if we got, yeah, let's go another, is that Bill's there? This is another one of Bill's, um, Duff, Bill uh, Reese that is, dovetail joints. So, you know, the classic, everybody loves looking at dovetails and they do have a, kind of a natural strength in that you have angled parts that are connected together. So even if you don't glue it, it's going to have some strength in it. Now let's uh, critique Bill's dovetails though, because um, it's always fun to look at them. There's some little gaps here, little gaps there. I think he needs to work on his technique maybe. Bill, you got anything to say on that? or? I do. Um, the gaps are due to the gaps are due to um, chip out, so back inside they've got much better uh, contact. So uh, I had a lot of problems with wood splintering as I was um, running the router bit through. And also, just for information on the top, I've identified Okay, there's, good. Yeah. There's an eight degree angle on the um, router bit that I use. Thanks, Bill. Um, yeah, so that's something to think about too, the angle of the bit. You know, there's all sorts of angles you can get, eight, 10, 12, I've even seen 14. Um, I think um, 14 are, are more supposed to be for softwoods. Um, your lower angles are supposed to be more for hardwood. So eight degrees is probably a good one to do for that. Um, so this is a eight degree dovetail. Um, did you use a machine bill to make this, a router or jig or? Yeah, I use a, a way uh, router jig. Okay, Lee? Yeah. Wow, okay, so you know, a, a Lee uh, jig is a really nice one to use. Um, you get very consistent results, so you'll get really good uh, fit on that. You can adjust the fit and fine tune it. Um, it's a nice, nice way to do them. So yeah, the, you know, the dovetail is kind of the, the joint that everybody kind of strives to, to make a perfect dovetail because it's beautiful. Um, and we'll see how strong it is, I guess. So it's up to 30 pounds. Nelson had a, a good question. Does it make a difference which leg you're putting on, pushing on? You know, are you pushing on the tail side or the pin side? I didn't think about that, Nelson. I just put the thing on there, so I'm not sure which side I'm pushing on, to tell you the truth. But it would make a difference, absolutely. So, so it probably would be good uh, to do a, a couple of these and do them different ways to just see how strong they are one way versus the other. Yeah, that would be fun to do a little competition, Ava said, to uh, have everybody do a joint and... 
Yeah, bring it for testing and see whose is the strongest and uh, whoever's the strongest would win some sort of door prize or something. We'll get Lane to buy, buy something real nice. So we're up to 135 and it's starting to back up a little bit. So um, it's really backing off now, it's back into 120. So this joint has failed. It hasn't been a you know, spectacular failure. There isn't any loud pops or anything, but it's certainly backing up on the force. So I'll, I'll let it go for another few seconds and then we'll stop and take a look at it. It was starting to kind of slide out of there, I think. So, I mean, if you want me to, I can do it again. So, is it on the pin side? So, I'll, I'll just do it again. Bill wants me to go a little bit further. So, we'll load it again, and I'll, I'll go a little faster. Yeah. So, uh, doing it a second time, it's up to 50, 75. 90. Uh, last time it got up to about 130. See if it gets back there again. Um, so it just shows you, you know, it's already got up to 110, but now it's starting to back off. So it shows you that once you've broken a joint, it's, it's not going to ever be any stronger than it was initially. Um, so my guess is the glue kind of fell, failed on that and, and broke apart. So um, we're We've got up to about 110 pounds, and now we've backed off to about 100 pounds. And um, now it's backing off further. You can see, I don't know if you can catch that on the video, but you can see where it's kind of coming apart. We'll take a look here. So, yeah, that's a nice looking, nice looking failure there, really. It wasn't spectacular, but it looks pretty cool now that we just look at it. Um, you know, the, the glue probably failed in here, and this is, you know, in grain gluing to long grain, so that's not going to be very strong. Um, yeah, it actually broke a little bit here. So that was not as strong as, as we thought, but, but of course the way we're loading it is important too. Um, probably if we loaded it the other way or just tried to pull this this way, it's going to be very strong. So, you know, one, one test does not tell us everything, but it is interesting to see. So that was the eight degree dovetail by Bill Reese. This, is this a Bill Reese? Yeah. This is a Bill Reese also, uh, three eighths inch finger joints. So these are all three eighths inch wide, um, nice looking joints, really, you know, no gaps at all. Uh, Bill even sanded it, it looks really nice. He did a great job on that. Um, what kind of jig did you use to make this wood, Bill? One I, one I built myself. Okay, with a router or table saw? I used a table saw. Table saw, okay. That's a nice looking piece. Too bad we gotta break it. All right, and it, there the dial started moving, so we're up to 15. You know, I, it'll be interesting to see. I, I've always kind of thought and read different places where finger joints are very strong because there's a lot of glue surface there that's, you know, long grain to long grain glue surface. But it can take, you know, some work to get things dialed in on your table saw or router uh, jigs to get it to fit just right. Now this one should be the same strength either direction we go. There's no angles on it. So we're up to about 150. So sometimes when you see the force slowing down it could be because it's lo it's left that um, straight line on that uh, that diagram where you compare the stress and the strain and that uh, elastic modulus of elasticity and started to do get into plastic deformation possibly. Um, so it, it's gotten up to about 190 pounds. So this particular machine does not measure deflection. Um, we can set up some gauges on here to measure that, to figure out what the strain is. Uh, but usually when we want to measure that, we have another machine in here, test machine that's hooked up to a computer. It's a lot more current. Um, it stores all the data for you. It measures a lot more. But I think visually this one's a fun, fun one to use. 
So, looks like 215 pounds. I'll go for another few seconds here to see if we can get anything fun to break on it. So yeah, those fingers are just kind of pulling apart right now. All the glue is, has lost its strength. So I'm gonna stop it. We'll unload it, take a look. So yeah, I got up to 215 pounds. So that, that uh, were, those were all Bill Reese's. I think we're now gonna go to Bill Calder. Um, so yeah. Separated them out. Yeah, you can see where it just kind of pulled, pulled those fingers, started pulling apart. Um, but it, it really did, it was a fairly strong joint. Not quite as strong as the, the miter joint or sure. the um, lock miter. So that's kind of an interesting, interesting thing. Bill Calder made this butt joint. He's an expert on butt joints, I guess. Um, so it's just the part butting into here, glued together, um, no mechanical fasteners or anything. You know, some people will do this and add some nails or something. Um, but we'll see how strong this is. So we're gonna, we're gonna load it like this, I think. And okay. yeah, good point, Bill. Um, these are all six inches wide, 12 inches long, three quarter inch thick, red oak, white oak. Um, so we have the butt joint loaded in there. Yeah, I'm guessing it's not gonna be very strong, but could be surprised. Some people will say on butt joints that you should kind of put sizing on that end grain. And so Bill did that on one of them and we'll see how, how, how much that helps on it. Actually, it's stronger than what I thought it would be. Um, gotten up to 55, gotten up to 57 and a half and it's, there was a little pop there. Um, so it's backed off, it's, it's broken. We could go for another few seconds here just to see if it totally breaks. So you can see some, uh, some cracks in the wood right here where it has failed. Um, but it's, it's not a spectacular fail, failure, but if we had kept going, it would have broken all the way off, I'm sure of that. Um, but really that was quite low. It got up to how much? 57 pounds. So so far, that's uh, you know half as strong as the other w second weakest one. So, so here's another butt joint, um, but now the end grain has been sized. So, uh, Bill Calder took some glue, put it on the end grain, um, let it halfway dry, and then to kind of seal that end grain up, and then put new glue on, clamped it together which, yeah, we've heard that that is supposed to make it a little stronger, we'll find out. So, so far, Bill Reese has really outshined Bill Calder on his joints. Um, but it's not fair, yeah. You've only tested one of mine. We've only, yeah, so here's another one of Bill Calder's. Um, so this is a butt joint with some sizing, 95, 100. So really, it's, it's twice as strong as the previous one, which, you know, surprises me. I thought it would be stronger, but I'm surprised it's this much stronger. 120, 135. There's a break. So it got up to 140 pounds. So Bill Calder said uh, this, this is just as strong as a miter with a biscuit. And this is a lot easier. Now he's right, it sure is. Um, so, you know, you could definitely hear the pop on it where it broke, but I, I don't see a whole lot. I mean, there's a little separation right here, but it's really, it looks pretty good still. So th this one here is another butt joint, but Bill Calder has put two uh, zero biscuits in here. He's glued where the biscuits went in and glued the the end grain also, but didn't do any sizing or pre. So, so we'll test this one and see see what we get. So we'll see if this one's stronger. It's got a little bit of a mechanical fastener in there with the biscuit. Uh, but like Ava said, 
Sometimes uh, putting a biscuit in or removing material to put a fastener can actually make the joint weaker. We'll see. 40, so it's, it's surpassed the previous joint. Oh, there's a failure, 150. So it got just a little bit more than the uh, butt joint was sizing. So those biscuits, you know, may give a little bit of strength, but, but not much. So butt joint with two number zero biscuits. There's a little bit of separation here. There's a little bit in here. Um, so excellent. This has quarter inch red oak dowels in it. No grooves on the dowels. Uh, dowels are one inch long. Uh, and are, okay, there's three. Three. So okay. uh, one inch from the e each edge and then centered. Okay. Three quarter inch dowels. We'll test it a similar way than we did have all the other. So did you just put glue on the dowels or did you do it on the end grain too? Or? On the end, I, everything was glue. Okay, so. So Bill did it similar to the last one. He glued the fasteners, the dowels, and also glued, put glue on the end grain. So we'll see how this one does. Now the dowels on the, um, going into the one board can't go r super deep because it's only th three quarter inch yeah, thick. So, so how uh, deep was I, it? In? The hole was three eighths of an inch deep. Okay. So, so the, yeah. So the one in. Okay, yeah. So it got up to 102 pounds. Interesting. So this was uh, one with quarter inch, three quarter inch dowels um, inserted about quarter of an inch? One inch. One, one inch. Well, no, I was one inch from the edge here. There I drilled three eighths of an inch in that it went to the center, the dowel rod stuck out you know, just over a quarter of an inch. But okay. Just enough space that I could pull it if there was a little glue on the end. Okay. So on, the, on the other board, it was the same distance in? Or? No, because it was a one inch long dowel, so I came down in three quarters of an inch. Okay. Gotcha. So it's about a quarter inch inserted here, three quarter inch here. So being that it's going into this side, you just can't get a whole lot of depth because of the thickness right. of the board. So um, one thing that we've done a lot of testing on dowel joints here, and we've shown that, that the further you can get that dowel inserted, the stronger it's going to be, just because, you know, there's more glue surface yeah, holding well, it. I debated to them. Like yeah. Every, you see the guys, and they do the true dowels. Right. Dowels, should I do that? Yeah. No, we'll keep them a exterior yeah. joint that looks, mm -hmm. looks, you know, you can use as a cabinet. or, or Right, right. Excellent. So um, the dowel was not very strong on that particular one, uh, but there's other joints where we probably could get the dowel to be stronger if we had more material to go into. Um, here's another one that Bill Calder has done. He's got three pocket screws here. Um, how the, are they fine threaded? Yes, fine threaded. That's uh, from the Craig system. Um, uh, they recommend it. Uh, inch and a quarter screws, fine threaded. Okay, so, for hardwood. Uh, so fine threaded, inch and a quarter long screws. He's got three of them. Um, if you use hardwood, you use fine thread for the Craig system and then the coarse thread for the softwoods. Yep. So, so we'll set this one up. And we do uh, some screw withdrawal test here to check the strength of material occasionally. Um, which is interesting to do, where you're just pulling that screw out of out of a piece of wood. So this is a really humongous machine. I don't know if you are able to see how tall it is, but we initially got this into our lab back in the early 60s um, or maybe 50s when we started doing tests on um, trusses for houses. And um, so we needed a really huge machine to, to break trusses and we had uh, some professors here who developed new ways to attach the trusses. So um, it's really kind of cool that that was developed here at Purdue University. They used to nail all the trusses together and the professors here came up with ways to put gusset plates on the outside of them. 
And of course they had to be tested to see, you know, they wanted to build houses with them and you don't want the houses to be any weaker, you want them to be stronger or as strong. It's got up to 45 pounds and now it's just kind of floating there, it's back to 40. We'll go for another minute here and see if it, we have a little bit more um, booming failure. You can see the part is starting to separate a little bit there. It's really kind of shocking how weak the, the three screws would be. You would think that, you know, the mechanical fastener like that would be stronger than the glue joints. So the Craig system, you know, although it's nice to be able to use, it's really quick and easy. Um, it obviously is not that strong. And you think about it, there are a lot of kitchen cabinets that are put together with these types of fasteners. So, you know, it depends what your application. If you're making nice heirloom type furniture, you probably don't want to use Craig screws. If you're making jigs and, you know, cheap kitchen cabinets, um, sorry, Bill, <laughs> uh, then. Solid maple. Oh, solid maple. I'm sure they're beautiful, though. So, so there's that. Okay. And now we have another one um, with three pocket screws, the same setup, the fine threaded screws, same type, except for one thing, Bill has now put some glue in there and glue. glue. All right, it's, it's loading now, so. We're up to 15 pounds, 25. I feel like an auctioneer or something, saying all these numbers. 25, 30, 35, 40. Yeah, that butt joint was 57 pounds, so it's, it's exceeded that. Oh, I heard a, heard a pop, so it has failed. It got up to 115 pounds. So that, that one was definitely stronger. You add the, you know, I think that, to, to me it shows you if you use the Craig pocket screws, you should put some glue in there too. Because um, it was considerably stronger. It got up to 110, 115 pounds. So, um, so that certainly makes me think about when I use pocket screws that I ought to add some glue to it too. So, um, so we'll just kind of go over these if you want to show this this screen here um, so these are our final scores so the strongest ones were certainly the miter joints uh, with the lock miter getting number one the regular miter there um, finger joint did excellent too so I would say you know those three joints are definitely in the tops as far as strength um, now as far as weakness um, Looks like the Craig screws um, was the weakest. The butt joint was the next weakest. And um, then the butt joint with dowels. So those three there, um, you probably don't want to use on your fine furniture. Um, like I said, the dowels are okay if, if they're inserted further. And if we've shown that to be true in a bunch of tests we've done here. But short little um, stubby um, dowels are not real strong. So um, I hope that helps you guys to understand um, joints and it's kind of a fun thing to make stuff and break it here in the Wood Research Lab. Um, Bill Reese is going to talk, did you have something you want to talk about Ava? I wanted to kind of add something kind yeah. of for explanation. When you have a simple board, you supply with very regular board so it doesn't have we have the edges and then also it is an end grain. So when we are gluing two end grains together, holding power is not there if you put the adhesive because actually you have this open pore and they will suck all the glue and there is nothing to hold. Therefore, you have to insert some fastener, dowel, biscuit or something. The ideal situation is when you are uh, gluing the edges of the, or the, the wall of the cells together, so it will be in this scenario. Yes? So you are gluing the edge of the or actually yeah, the wall face to face or the wall of the cells together and this is explaining very well why such a bump in this uh, 2D 
deeper and wider joints. So when we are having these lobes, wider joints, so we are actually doing these lobes giving a little bit more of that effect to gluing face to face. Mm -hmm. We are not gluing only open grains together, but we are giving that space. So every time when you are thinking about that joint, maybe when you are thinking about gluing, do I have that faces together? Do I have some kind of way that I'm gluing those fibers, walls together, not the ends of fibers together? And and I like to look at it as, as long grain or in grain. That's yeah. the way I exactly. look at it so too. So better to glue long grain long together grain. than in exactly. grain. So yeah. yep. Exactly. Always try to maximize your long grain yeah. gluing. So yeah. thank you very much. Was yeah, very yeah. And yeah. So next we're gonna ha actually demonstrate making some uh, biscuit joints. So Bill Reese is going to do that, so thank you. So before Bill talks about how to do the biscuit joints, we all, our club, every meeting will do a, um, an auction where people bring in stuff and we sell it and make a little money for the club, buy some uh, kind of small items that we then give away to the club. We also have a show and tell. And the person or people who do the show and tell, they get entered into a drawing. Their name gets, a name gets pulled and they get a prize. So for today's show and tell, I'm the only one that brought anything. So um, Lane Kirby, if you're watching this, you owe me something. Uh, so I've got this bowl that I thought maybe somebody would be interested in seeing. But I drew this up in CAD, 3D, very organic shape. And... Um, you know, I wanted to come up with something a little different than the traditional bowl. I've made some traditional bowls, um, both the old-fashioned way, chopping them out of a log with an adze, and uh, the kind of new way of using a CNC router. And the CNC router opens up a lot of possibilities. So I drew this in CAD, took a big chunk of cherry, put it on the CNC router, and then um, carved it out. And it really did a great job. It leaves some little ridges in, so I have to do still have to do sanding on it but um, but after my sanding this is what it looks like and uh, I'm happy with it I've got some other designs I want to try to make next um, but then when I've showed this to a few people they're like oh that's not a bowl that's a hat so you know I guess it could be whatever you want it to be but feed your dog out of it Bill says now that's that's really nice yeah you know, when you spend all that time, it probably took me 30 hours just to draw this thing. And then Bill wants me to feed my dog with it. So, no, just joking. So, here, Bill, you're up next. So, a biscuit joiner is a tool that just cuts a groove in your piece of wood. Then you have a biscuit like this that would fit in there cut the same groove in a mating piece and so you use a biscuit joiner to um, join two pieces of wood together uh, and Bill Calder will tell you more about that. So let's take a look at the piece of equipment that we're using. So this is uh, our tool and it has a circular blade that's captured inside of the machine so that when you're cutting, all you need to do is push the handle forward and exposes the blade or runs the blade into your piece of wood. The tool has just a face plate and you can see it's got okay so much for another electronic device it doesn't work we got a little registration mark here and this plate will slip fall down like that And you've got a guide <coughs> mark here, as well as the one back here. 
and on the side is an angle gauge so you can set this plate at whatever angle you want and that's how I made this groove uh, set or gauge at 45 degree angle. This particular machine, if you come to here, you can drop this down and get even greater angles beyond regular zero to 90 degrees. On the other side of the tool is a, a different settings for the different sizes of biscuits and this has a fine tuning uh, capabilities there and there's also fine tuning capabilities up here as far as your 90 degree setting. So out on the market there's a lot of different biscuits that you can get. Some are better suited for biscuit joinery than others. These you can just got a little snack. This you can reward your help with if they do a good job. <laughs> so the biscuits come in four different sizes. Does that help? I put a little die on each of these so that it would show up a little bit better for a camera. So you have a, a 20, the biggest, then a 10, an aught, and a FF. Um, the blade that's in the machine, it will cut a groove for the aught, the 10, and the 20. To cut a groove for the FF size, you need to interchange blades and just take the bottom off of this and uh, it's really not very difficult to change the blade in the machine. So on the side of the machine, you can move this fence up and down depending on the thickness of the material, depending on where you want to place your groove. And uh, the scale here records the distance from the bottom of the plate to the center of the blade. Now in this particular machine, this guide here, the white mark lining up with that is the center of the blade and the bottom of this is the bottom of the blade and the top of this corresponds then to the top of the blade. So you can do some pretty fine placement um, so we're going to demonstrate uh, gluing up uh, a couple of boards <coughs> and using the number 10 biscuit so it's set for that size, <coughs> excuse me, a biscuit. It comes with a dust collection bag, it, as you all know, those only work about half um, or you can put a little deflector 
on the side of it and blow the sawdust out that way and clean it up later. There's also a guide plate that you can add on to the bottom of a machine like so. And if you, if you want to cut a double width groove that you could put two biscuits in that groove, one on top of the other. But you do cut your first biscuit like so, then add this plate, and that then changes the thickness of the base here enough that you could give a, get a slot that's wide enough for two biscuits. The actual purpose of this <coughs> plate is for the fact that, you know, this is open. If you got a inch and a half or a two inch wide riser that you're using to put across, it's really wobbly. By putting the plate on there, the plate then gives you a solid surface for that to slide on. Um, so having said that, if you only got an inch and a half board, you're going to be using an O or a double F because of the width of the cut. Otherwise, you, your, your ends are going to show you, and your board will have been cut. These biscuits um, are made either out of compressed <coughs> beech wood or some type of wood product. But the important thing to keep in mind is that they will absorb moisture. They absorb the moisture from the glue and they expand in that groove and that's what helps to, to hold it in place and gives the added strength uh, to the joint. So it's important that you keep the biscuits in a good tight, airtight, sealed container. All right, that's all there is to it. And we'll go out in the shop and give you a little demonstration. Hi, I was supposed to be behind the scenes, but somehow I got caught and involved in being in front of it. So I get to demonstrate how this actually works. This is a really Porter Cable unit. It's really nice. It has a number of presets at, at positions, so it makes it really easy. Your 90 degrees is set at very simply. As Bill demonstrated, you can tip it all kinds of different ways. One of the points that he did mention, and, but really didn't point out, was this comes to 135 degrees. Now, if you think about it, to go from there, you need 45 degrees to go to 180. So if you were trying to do a biscuit into a standard 90 degree corner that you mitered, rather than trying to adjust things, if you have your board cut, look at that. That's right there on your angle. Makes it really nice. It's one of the uh, advantages of this machine. Things that they don't tell you too much other than saying have, have a practice board, is you have to have practice boards to cut into Otherwise, when this slides in, it can go too far. And all of a sudden, your biscuit is sticking out the back. So always test your cuts. Make sure you're not too close to the edge where you would rip out to the side. Or going so deep on a uh, mitered corner that you go through. Those are always fun things. Done them. Growled about them. Bill already has this set up for a number 10 biscuit. And so we're just going to show that how simple and easy this piece of machinery is. Notice I did all that with it unplugged. I like my fingers. So. They always say do it two-handed. 
Personally, see I'm on the wrong side. I'd be on that side because it's easier, but I would do this left-handed. I like putting my uh, offhand out on this, this plate because that holds it. This is nice and stable. So that therefore when you are ready to do your biscuit, we don't have any lines here, so I'm just going to come a little bit towards this side. You can just put your hand on there, holding it nice and tight. Turn it on. Now they come out. Bill mentioned he goes in and out a couple times. Most people prefer that. I reread the manual today, this morning, just to double check. When they just say one and slide it in all the way, release it, let the blade stop before you pull it out. One of the things you have to watch out for, I don't know, you was barely there, but there are often little tear outs out at the very edge, edge of your cut. So you have to check those before you try gluing your pieces together because otherwise they keep it from forming a nice tight butt joint. As you saw earlier from the test, all this is going to do really is help hold that joint together while the glue sets. That's, as you see though, for an O, no this is a 10. 10 is like two and a quarter. I think it makes a much larger hole. So that's really important when you are gluing and trying to set a second biscuit into something. Uh, really that's how simple it is to do. Yeah, we did a double shot for you, Bill. Since this is just a scrap. Biscuit fits nice and neat. And if your depth is set right, you end up with a nice smooth on both sides. Which, you know, you can see it actually came out really nice, which is awesome since I didn't measure beforehand. The nice advantage of edge gluing boards this way uh, is if your boards have a little warp or twist to them, when you glue them together those biscuits can help align them so that therefore when you clamp it, it's holding it in line, you're not saying, oh God, that's off. I got a lip there I have to sand. When gluing edge boards using the biscuits, they recommend that you come out three inches from the edge for your first one, center. As I just showed, you know, here's your biscuit. You really don't need three inches, so it depends upon how big a board you want, how close are you going to trim this board. Make sure when you put this, unless you want that cut to show that your biscuit is far enough in that it doesn't show. That therefore, you just have nice end grain showing all across your cut. Bill already pre-marked. This is going to be a shelf that he's making uh, where he's going to cut it so we know where the biscuits, how far to the edge they can be without exposing the cuts. So he has a set where he wants five biscuits in this board while, which is really fairly simple. So we're just going to take the boards and move them over to the side there so we can go ahead and zap through these. One of the things that I have found in doing biscuits is, you know, you centered it. 
Well, sometimes centered, really it doesn't end up coming out centered. So keep your boards always same face up. Don't cut the face on this side and then this face on the other board because when you put them together, if you're off, off a 32nd, it will show up enough that you will feel the edge. Okay, again, I know I'm not wearing goggles, I'm not wearing ear protection, I'm being bad. But, you, I don't think you can see that, can you? I'm using the red marker, red index, and the pencil line that were bill marked, so that therefore we're all set. So all we have to do is line it up. And we can just shoot right down the line. And back just a touch, there we go. There's a chip. You can see it. So this wasn't is not bad. What's your cord on there? Another little one there. Some of the biscuits will be a little bit thicker than others. And I like the if I run across one that's a little bit thicker, um, I usually set it aside because they don't take long to swell up once you get some glue on them. Uh, so you just want that biscuit to just slide in uh, quite easily. Check them all. That goes in real slick. I like that. that That's a little tight. snug. That one's tight, so. I'll... That one dropped in nicely. No. You dry fit them or one, no? One more. Oh, you didn't like that one, eh? No, it's fine. When you get ready to glue this thing up, you want it to go quickly and smooth. And if there's any problems, it's nice to have an extra biscuit just sitting there that you can quickly grab it and stick it in in case uh, there's a problem. Occasionally, I'll find a biscuit that's got kind of a, a chip on the side of it or so doesn't really fit nice or it's malformed or something I'm not happy with it so I can quickly discard it and I'll have a spare uh, ready to go.
Looks pretty good, Looks Bill. Bill likes using these brushes. I use usually a one inch foam brush. Since I usually do this by myself, don't have someone else helping me, it goes a little quicker. Good. Now, I started at one end. It has a tendency to that's nice. That way feels a little better. It took a little bit of your twist out. Happy with that? Yeah, that's good. Well, I don't bother. Oh, you don't? Cleaning that off, but I'm not going to wait 20 minutes to come back and scrape it off. So go ahead and wipe, wipe that down. People will say getting water down into that joint won't weaken that glue, which I'm, I'm sure it probably will. It'll, it's good. And that's how simple it is.